right. I need to get our Facebook viewers in, but hello to our friends on YouTube. Um, and here we are going live for our friends on Facebook too. All right. Well, hey everybody. I am your Wichita Audubon Vice President, Rachel Roth, and I'm really excited about our guest speaker that we have here today. I'm gonna let her introduce herself here in just a second. But first I have our Audubon announcements. Um, as you hopefully are aware, our Western Kansas extended field trip has been canceled. There just wasn't a way for us to safely conduct that field trip. Um, but we do have a Marion County field trip coming up on uh, March 27th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're gonna be meeting on location. You can get more information from our website, wichitaaudubon.org. So uh, check that out for more information, but I am more interested today in hearing from our guest speaker. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you introduce yourself and pass it on over to you. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Um, um, I'm Vicki Sikonik. I'm with Kansas Wildlife Parks. I'm a district biologist. Uh, may, mainly cover a few counties, Greenwood, Elk, Chautauqua, Montgomery counties, working with private landowners. Um, been with the department for about uh, eight years now, doing, doing that kind of work. Um, prior to that, I uh, worked on my master's at Fort Hayes on prairie chicken. Um, prior to that, I did some several seasonal jobs, including actually working um, with prairie chicken in the Flint Hills. Uh, under a, a PhD student at Kansas State um, and where I trapped and collared and tracked can uh, prairie chickens all over the Flint Hills. And so it was a good time. I did learn a lot and, and hopefully I can relay some of that stuff to you. I'm a, I'm a prairie chicken lover and I hope after this you will be too. Um, so we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let me share my screen. It's kind of a first time for me doing one of these. So bear with me guys. Can you see that okay, Rachel? Uh, it's not showing up for me just yet. Let's try that. There you now? go. Okay, great. Okay, so my presentation is about prairie chicken. I call it boomer bust. <laughs> um, and that's a really a coined term for prairie chicken or prairie grouse. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. Um, but basically, this is just going to be a brief look into the life history and, and status of the prairie chicken in Kansas. So some of you might know, this, we have two different types of prairie chicken in Kansas. We have the greater prairie chicken and we have the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, the greater prairie chicken um, mainly found in um, eastern Kansas in the Flint Hills and the northern and northern central Smoky Hills area. Lesser prairie chicken primarily found in Southwest Kansas in the mixed grass prairie, sand sage prairie. Um, big differences in the two birds, not really big differences I would say, um, is the males have really obvious air sacs, especially in the spring. Uh, the lesser prairie chicken having a red air sac, the greater prairie chicken having a more orange air sac. The hens are almost in indistinguishable in hand, they are a little bit smaller, maybe by about a half a pound, so really not much. Um, but you can see in this in this picture of the hens is the like lesser prairie chicken hen has a lighter, um, less streaking or a lighter streaking on the on the on the breast feathers than the than the hen and the male greater prairie chicken. So these birds are non-migratory; um, they pretty much stay where they are all year. They, they migrate short distances, if you want to call it migration, to feeding grounds, um, and those are just daily movements. So birds will pick up early in the morning, head to a feeding ground, and then they'll, they'll um, pick up midday and head back to their loafing ground for the day, and that's primarily in the winter. Um, typically, you find them on large tracts of native rangeland with very little tree encroachment or human development. Um, they're generally fairly long-lived birds. They can live three to five years um, if they make it to adulthood, which is which is the really tough part. Uh, the primary predators are of, of adults are hawks, um, but of, of the chicks, pretty much everything. Everything wants to eat a chick. So it's tough to be a young bird in the prairie. 
<clears throat> Typical adult home range can be anywhere from around three square miles. So they can, they can get up and move pretty good. There is a hybrid zone and you can kind of see um, in the West, somewhere around Ellis County and Trigo County, there is an area where oh, they do overlap feeding grounds. So there has been some discussion over whether these are actually two different species because in captivity, they have been able to breed lesser to greater chickens and um, result in a fertile offspring, which is one of the definitions of being its own species. So there has been a lot of debate um, over the years. The lesser prairie chicken was actually identified as potential its own species in, um, I think it was 1885. But since then, it's, there's been just debate after debate. Are they actually their own species? But we, they are still recognized by the American Ornithologist Union as a separate species. So we still call them a separate species. Uh, their diets uh, in the spring and summer, they're typically eating insects and, and other invertebrates. Uh, they will eat grains if they're available, typically native grass grains or native forb grains. In the fall and winter, uh, they really can't get a hold of any inverts, so they're, they're moving up strictly to grains and, and actually maybe even some plant material as well. Um, but they, they have hever, become heavily reliable, reliant on um, agriculture grains, such as the milo in the picture there. So to reproduction, um, many of you might have heard the, the word lek. So this is a coined term for, the, um, for what prairie grouse do, is that, or, or the verb is called lekking. So birds are out there lekking. This is typically the males. And what they do is they hang out on the tops of the hill, uh, dance around, fight for space, um, and wait for the hens to come. So I, I always talk about likening this to, um, to a male singles bar. And so you have a male singles bar, there's, there's some dancing going on, the males are all kind of getting along, but there, there's a little bit of fighting. But man, when a, when a female walks in, all hell breaks loose and, and they're now um, fighting and carrying on and, and, and the, the hens are picking out which one's the best male. And typically that best male is in the middle of the lek um, and he has been the one kind of holding that spot, fighting for it. Um, typically, you know, the, the hens might see that as the stronger male. Um, and that stronger or that, that center lek or that dominant male will get about 95% of the, of the populations that year. Now, he might not hold that, that, that spot next year. But that year, if he gets to hold that spot the whole year, he will get 95% 90 of the copulations on the lek. Um, the habitat requirements that they have during uh, this time, typically short grass, like I said, on the top of the hill with a high vantage point, um, where there really isn't anything obstructing their view of hens or the hens view of them. And also where there might not be a lot of other noise where they might not be heard. So if you want to go out and, and listen for these guys, they can be, humans can audibly hear them at about, depending on the day, one to two miles. So they can, they can, they can carry some range. So I do have, um, for those of you who have never seen a prairie chicken, I did pull up a couple of YouTube videos and bear with me, ignore the stuff on the side of possible searches for stuff like that, but um, hopefully, We'll be able to hear them if I chose to share this screen correctly. So again, these are the males dancing around, waiting for the hens to come in. They'll stomp their feet, flick their tail, and on a really Still day, you can actually hear feet stomping and the tail flicking. And there's hens here in the video. So they're pretty excited. Um, and there's a video of lesser raging. Bear with me. This is the sound of the lesser prairie chicken. A little different. They actually, the greater prairie chickens are considered booming. The lesser prairie chicken are said to gobble. 
and it kind of had more of a high pitched gobbling sound. And the bites are real bites. They're not just display. Um, oftentimes you'll see feathers flying. They'll grab a hold of each other's feathers and pluck them out. Their, their feet, they're going to kick, um, kick feathers out. So it's, it's a pretty uh, costly display for them to be doing that, um, especially all day long for about three months out of the year. So after, after the hens get bred on the lex, they then move on to nesting um, and the males contribute nothing to the nesting. So they're out, they're out there sitting on the lex waiting for more hens to come in while the hen they just made it with is off to, to lay the eggs. Um, the females will typically lay 10 to 14 eggs in a nest. Uh, she will make two or three attempts if the first nest or two fail, she'll go for a third nest, um, as long as it's not too late in the season. So they are pretty, pretty, pretty well aware of how late it is in the season, to probably by day length, um, that they won't, they'll, they won't attempt the nest if it's going to be too late and then the chicks will hatch too late and won't survive. Um, you can see in this bottom picture on the right that that is a hen sitting on the nest. So it is, it is really well good for her to be concealed while she's sitting on the nest. Once all the eggs are laid, she will actually incubate, incubate for about 24 days, which is typical of even our domestic chickens, roughly about 24 to 26 days. Um, and so as she gets closer to hatch date, she'll stay on the nest longer and longer without breaks. So she could be on there 24 hours or so. Um, and she needs to be really well concealed to help protect that her and her nest. <laughs> so then the chicks are, are hatched. Um, peak hatch is typically July, uh, late June. Um, and so, but, but because they are re-nesting potentially throughout the year, if their first nest fa fails, um, we could have other hatch dates as late as September. Um, the chicks are what you think about when you think about your little chicken chicks when you go to Orsalins and, and play with the little chicks there. They're, they're small little chicks. They're usually pretty cryptic in color to try to help conceal them. Um, but again, like I said earlier, this is a rough time to be a chicken um, when, when they're this small. They can't fly, but they can get out of the nest. So they are precocial. Um, sorry. Yeah, precocial. And so they can they get out of the nest right as soon as they hatch and they, they follow mom. So within about 12 hours of hatching, they're typically could potentially be upwards of, half, of a half mile away from the nest. Um, so everything's out to eat them, anything from a hawk to a skunk to a, a raccoon to a snake to whatever can catch them is going to eat them. Um, they can't fly until about 14 days old. And even then they're not great flyers. They can only get up and get, get out maybe about 20 yards. So um, at about 36 days, they can then potentially leave mom. They are able to thermoregulate on their own, uh, but they don't typically from what, what research has shown, they, they'll probably stay with mom potentially even through the winter until um, to lecking season the next year. But they, they have been shown to actually leave you know, as, as early as 36 days. <clears throat> so when they are young, this is when they're gonna be eating the most insects, you know, try to get as much protein in them as, as possible to grow as fast as they can. Um, this is when they need um, really good structure, a lot of bare ground to be able to walk. If you're a chick the size of a, a little cup like that, you need to be able to move around through the grass. So tall, rank CRP grass is not necessarily always the best for young young birds if they can't fly. <clears throat> so historically, um, chickens have been around, you know, as, as long as European settlers know of. Um, when they first settled here, they were, they were, they were here, but they weren't really abundant. Um, the, the first big boom of birds, and this is one of the reasons we call it boom or bust, um, because if, if there's good weather, good habitat, um, 
the chickens are able to reproduce really well. And again, they lay 14 eggs in a nest, so they, they could replace themselves, you know, times, you know, five to 10. So there is a potential that the population can grow really fast if the habitat is good and the weather is good that year. And so when early settlers came and they started farming, uh, the limiting factor for chickens growing their populations was actually wintering food. And so when, when early settlers started farming, the grain, the waste grain that was left in the fields was exactly what those chickens needed to get them through the winter. And so the, the early settlers saw this huge boom in chickens to where they, you know, they talk about, you know, five, 600 birds just blackening out the sky flying into um, a wheat field or a corn field or an oat field in, in, this, in the wintertime, in the evenings. And so they had this huge boom, huge number of chickens and, and hunting was a big, um, a big market back then. As you can see in the pictures, there's a, a lot of chickens. Um, I think the one in the top is from Oklahoma. I think the one on the bottom left is Kansas. And I can't remember where the bottom right came from. But it was actually considered um, at one point kind of a poor man's bird because it was just so easy to get. The rich people were like, oh, I can't eat another chicken. It's just too much. And so, um, <clears throat> so they saw that huge boom. But then at, at some point that that level of agriculture started tipping the wrong direction when we started seeing a lot more agriculture and a lot less grass especially out in the western plains we they started seeing a decline and they actually really started noticing this as early as the 1860s um and so the, then as as you know they started noticing it the they started putting actually um uh actual hunting regulations on them where you can only take so many uh, and I think that back then it was like 15 to 20 birds so it was still a good number whereas right now you know hunting is two birds so um so they started noticing these population declines and and the early 1900s they started really noticing them and started really putting checks on the on the hunting and even allowed Kansas allowed counties to regulate their own hunting of chickens um, and I think in the early 1900s is when some of the counties actually um, decided, okay, yeah, we're not, we're not allowing hunt, chicken hunting anymore. And that was mainly the Western counties. And again, because that's where they started seeing that huge decline because it started tipping the other direction, too much farming, not enough nesting and brood rearing habitat. And then the Dust Bowl hit. Um, and that's where we go back to good weather equals good habitat equals a boom in chickens. Well, in bad weather, you get bad habitat and you have a huge bust in chickens, you get a huge decline. And so not only was the Dust Bowl hard for the humans that were settled here, it was pretty tough for the, for the wildlife. And because the numbers were already on the decline, we saw a huge decline, especially out in Western Kansas of, of prairie chicken, Western Kansas and, and across much of its range into Oklahoma and Texas and um, Nebraska. So if we, we look at the populations, um, the population graphs. So in this, in this map here, um, hopefully you can see it, there's a lighter gray area and that's what's considered the historic range of the lesser prairie chicken. Um, that was pre-Dust Bowl, you know, when Europeans settled here and there's booms and chickens. Um, that's, what the, that's what the range was thought to be. Then the Dust Bowl hit and modern farming hit. We have less waste grain. Um, we're farming a lot more. We're farming more acres. We're farming fence row to fence row. We're sod busting things that you know maybe are marginal and maybe probably shouldn't have been um, busted. Um, and so, you know, the chicken population, the lesser chicken, this is just lesser chicken, sorry, um, has decreased quite a bit. And so the dark gray in this map is where the chick lesser chicken currently can be found. And you can see Kansas really is the stronghold still for lesser prairie chicken. We, we noticed it pretty early and, and like I said, those western counties had the ability to shut off hunting and, and try to start some mitigation early on, um, but it maybe, maybe it was a little too late, who knows. The chicken, the lesser chicken was listed on the Federal Endangered Species list briefly. Um, and then since then it's 
there were some lawsuits involved and, and since then it's now warranted but precluded. And so it's not listed anymore. Um, but these, this graph here on the bottom is actually the state graph for, um, for the chickens, the, the estimated chickens based on our survey routes, the state survey routes. So they're, they're, they have had some bust years even in the last couple of years, especially, so good rain out in Western Kansas is a good thing. Obviously it means more grass, it means more, um, more habitat, better habitat, more quality habitat. And so typically we, we do see good boom years on years of good weather out in Western Kansas for chickens. The greater prairie chicken is kind of in the same um, same boat, the lighter gray in this map again is the, the historic, the thought to be historic range of the greater prairie chicken. Um, used to be all the way up into Canada. Uh, since then, I don't know if they've seen a bird in Canada, except for they, they may have tried some relocation. Um, but for the most part, no birds up in Canada anymore. And again, Kansas really still holds the strongholds of greater chickens too. So we're doing something right here in Kansas. And I, I can I contribute to some of that uh, a little bit later as to what we're doing right, that other states maybe didn't start out the, the right way. Um, but we we are still declining here in Kansas. Um, a couple of years ago, we've been doing, we started aerial surveys of greater chickens. Um, and in a three year aerial study, um, one in 2015, and then the second one in 2018, uh, we estimated an 11.4% decrease in a statewide abundance. Now that's, that includes the Flint Hills, the Smoky Hills, um, and the Northern High Plains. So that's still a pretty good decline, but there's still quite a bit of numbers of chickens out there compared to other states. So as I mentioned in the reproduction section, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a shocker, but chickens need grasslands. Um, but they really need grasslands at different stages. And so I talked about with the lex, they really need that short grass up on top of a hill, um, no obstructions, no trees, no human development, you know, to be able to be heard and be seen. Um, then you get into nesting habitat and they really need that thicker grass. So something like, you know, if you, if you look at something that when the effects of burning, um, which they do burn in the Flint Hills quite a bit, which is where the chickens kind of still have a stronghold and in the Smokies, there's a little bit of burning. Um, the nesting habitat really can't be something that has been burned in the last year. And so they need more vegetative structure, they need more dead material to try to build that cover over them um, to protect them from predators and even protect them from some of the weather that we might get in June and July, some of that hot weather. Now, when, they, when the chicks have hatched and they're going into brooding, that's when they need the open space in between all the vegetation for those young chicks to run around in, um, be able to find insects. So they need a lot of um, green vegetation to attract all those insects. So high insect abundance is the key for the brooding. And that's, that's where you're gonna get your stuff that's just a year after burning. So after your first year of burn, there's really nothing there. That second year of burn, that's when stuff has been um, growing and, and usually you get a good flush of, of forbs some flowering plants and you get a good flush of green grasses. That's where you're gonna find your broods and that's where they're gonna be hanging out. And then in the winter, they kind of use a nice variety of all that stuff, including some agriculture fields. So really the limiting factor we're seeing now where is, is actually the nesting and brooding cover Whereas historically, before early European settlement, it was actually the, the food. And that's why when, when agriculture came, they had a big boom until we tipped the scales the other way. So, so this is the same graph, but we can also see that other grassland birds need this stuff too. They need that diversity across the landscape. So just having a solid stand of unburnt grass, you know, that may have some trees encroaching on it or or is just a rank stand of grass is not gonna be beneficial for killdeer, larkspurs, lark sparrows, or upland sandpipers, but it might be exactly what a henslow sparrow needs. Um, whereas um, having something that's freshly burned, like the Flint Hills, where they burn every year, is gonna be more beneficial for the killdeer, lark sparrow, and upland sandpiper, but is gonna be detrimental to a henslow sparrow. And I must say that all of these or most of these um, prairie species of birds are all in decline. And so um, they're all suffering that same fate as the prairie chicken. 
but I have this little chicken here with the umbrella because the chickens are actually considered a, a keystone species or what's called an umbrella species. So if you're managing good for prairie chicken and you have prairie chickens in the area, that means you must have all of these habitat components, this, this rank, more rank nesting grass, the brood cover and the short stuff the, for the lecking. Um, and so you, you would have a lot of these other species of, of grassland birds. And so having that umbrella species and managing specifically for chickens might be a good way to manage for all these other grassland birds. So I guess it's kind of getting into why, why are the chickens you know, in decline? And it's hard to point the finger at any one thing. Obviously I said, good weather, good habitat equals a good boom year. Um, but you know, sometimes we don't see that boom year, even on good weather year. And that's a lot of it's because the habitat is not there. Even, even if it's a good year and the habitat should be good, humans have um, kind of interfered. And so there, there's an issue. And so in this comic, it's this chicken's looking for some good grass. And if he can't find the good grass, he's going to be more attractive to predators. He's going to be more easily found to predators, such as the snakes and the hawks and the coyotes and bobcats. So fragment, habitat fragmentation, habitat loss is going to be a big issue. So I talked about the extensive sod busting. This picture is actually an aerial photo from Western Kansas, um, you know, where there used to be plenty of short grass prairie. Um, a mixed grass prairie and, and now there's a lot of just center pivots and really which doesn't doesn't do much for chickens except for a little bit of winter forage um, which now I, as I mentioned the nesting and the brood rearing habitat is really what's the limiting factor because where in this can a chicken nest there's there's not a lot of space in there um, so one of the things that that's been coined actually by pheasants forever is um, why don't we farm the best and conserve the rest so, you know, in the, in the 30s and 40s, the, the Dust Bowl era, we were farming as much as we could. You know, let's, let's bust everything out. If it's flat and, it's, and we can get a tractor through it, let's farm it. Um, but now maybe people are starting to realize that this less marginal ground is not getting us the, the money out of it that we're putting into it as far as fertilizer, as far as um, you know, if we have a wet year, it turns into a, a, a little wetland and we can't get tractors into it. And we can't harvest anything off of it. So we're not making that money back. And so that's where the CRP program came in, the Conservation Reserve Program. And this is one of the things that Kansas did the best. Um, and, and we can kind of give ourselves a little pat on the back because um, wildlife and parks, and I can't give myself credit for this because I wasn't around at this point, um, but it, it's actually 32 years now ago, um, the CRP program started and, and the biologist with wildlife and parks said, you know, if we're gonna do this, let's do this right, let's plant native grasses. You know, if, if, if we want the CRP program to work well and work for, for soil, water and wildlife, then it needs to be native. While, while we were planting native grasses, Texas and Oklahoma were planting non-natives. So brome and fescue, because they were more cattle oriented. And we said, no, we want this program to be more wildlife oriented. It can still be cattle oriented. That's, there's nothing saying that cattle can't graze the native grasses, but it's, it's more saying that if it's gonna benefit cattle, then why, why shouldn't it benefit the wildlife too? And so Kansas did this right. This is, this is a, one of the reasons I believe that Kansas still has the stronghold on lesser prairie chicken and greater prairie chicken in, in the country. So again, sod busting, um, we, we can throw herbicides and pesticides in there, when, which are also associated with um, farming operations. They're also associated with cattle operations. We, as far as um, noxious weeds go, we do a lot of herbicide treatments on noxious weeds, and we do some huge broadcast spraying of, of native rangelands to try to com combat those noxious weeds. Well you're not only killing the noxious weeds, but you're also killing a lot of those native flowers that um, attract all those insects for our native grassland birds, such as chickens. Um, so this is one of those examples to farm the best, conserve the rest. If, if you're burying tractors in mud holes, then maybe this is not the best 
um, ag field to be planting and, and maybe that it, and it doesn't have to be the whole field just plant that that little wetland area back to grasses and let it be a wetland and let it be a, a little nesting area for chickens on the edges and and save yourself a lot of headache trying to get those tractors out of a mud hole. Um, one of the other things we see on native rangelands, um, you know, while it still is native rangelands, it's not not producing much for grassland birds if it's being overgrazed, if it's being grazed down to the crowns of the of the grass. Um, and so we see this a lot. So one of the things that was coined by a, a rancher in New Mexico, who's a really big prairie chicken advocate, he says on his ground, what's good for the prairie chicken is is good for the cattle. And so if you're managing for prairie chicken and you're managing for those native grasses, then, then you should be doing good on your cattle operation. And so it, a lot of the times it's thought to be more money more equals more cows. So what we always tell producers is that if you can throw a football out as far as you can throw it and you can still see it, then your grass is too short for a prairie chicken to nest in. You know, prairie chicken's about the size of a football, maybe even a little smaller. So if you can still see that football, then, then your grass is too short and you're not grazing well enough. So um, cattle operations are all often used um, as an example for the tragedy of the commons. So um, the land is good. There's nobody regulating the resource. So you throw some cattle out there, you make some money. Well, heck, I could throw more cattle out there and make more money. Why can't I even throw more cattle out there and raise more money? And so that, to some extent, that's how, that's what we see in some of the grassland areas, um, you know, in the Flint Hills. I mean, I'm not saying every landowner does this, but there, there is that mentality sometimes out there that if, um, if, if there's still grass in the field, then I should be able to still graze it. And so that's what they do. The other thing we see is, is burning or lack of. So it's, it's kind of a tale of two odds, I guess. Um, you got the annual burning early intensive stocking that goes on in the Flint Hills. That's what you see probably starting now. Um, the, the burning is going on and, that, and the whole goal of that is cattle operation, it's cattle gains. Um, and we can all understand that. The more gain your cows get, the more money you can get from them at the end of the year. And so this allows them access to the green grass sooner, and then you can out there sooner, and then um, you get gains a lot faster. Now, on the other hand, is the lack of burning. And we see this often in Western Kansas, but we even see it in Eastern Kansas. Smokey the Bear was probably one of the best campaigns to ever come through the United States. It scared the pants off of a lot of people in fire. And maybe some of you sitting at home right now you know, you think of fire and you, you think of a bad, it's a bad thing, you know, and it might be, it is in your house, but as far as a prairie, a prairie would have historically burned every roughly three years, maybe not every year, like in the annual burning early intensive stocking farm um, rotation, but it, it still should be burned every three, three to five years. And that's where you get that mosaic on the habitat for the prairie chicken in that grass, in that graph I showed you earlier, where the nesting and the brood rearing and the lecking um, habitat is, is created. And that's really what our grassland birds were, were evolved on, is, is that mosaic of burning burned areas versus not unburned areas or several years after burned areas. Um, so the cedar tree encroachment in Kansas and the Great Plains in general is a, is a big topic right now. Um, and, it, and you can't just point it at cedar trees, it's hedge, hedge or Osage orange trees also, honey locusts as well. But cedar trees have kind of gotten the big, um, big topic right now. And so here's, here's an aerial image, well, kind of an aerial image of um, Kansas. And you can see Wichita, these are both the same picture. The top one is taken in 2019. I should have labeled these, not 2019. Um, sorry, 2000 year 2000. So you can see Wichita on the left-hand side, El Dorado Lake, just north of north and east of that. Uh, Fall River and Toronto Lake are on the east, east side. And so the, the green area is the Flint Hills. So that's area that all should be grasslands and should be good, great chicken habitat. All the red is the cedar tree encroachment that's encroaching into that, that grassland, into that prairie. 
the second picture on the bottom right is, um, this is 2019. So this was just last year, an estimated abundance of cedar tree encroachment. And so you can see the cedar trees are really kind of encroaching in that central part of that grasslands. And so it's, it's limiting access to the, to the prairie chicken and other grassland birds that really are grassland ob obligate species that really require large expanses of open grass. So it's limiting those areas even more for those birds to be hanging out. And so if, if it continues down this trend, and, and again, this is, this is just 20 years or just under 20 years. So another 20 years, is there gonna be any green left on this, on this map? And so we're trying to, really trying to reverse this trend, but it's, it's a difficult trend to, trend to stop. Oh, this is a graph of um, the chance that a chicken would nest um, in an area, It's a probability that a chicken will nest in an area based on the trees per hectare. Okay, so trees per hectare is on the bottom and then the probability. So as the trees per hectare goes up, up to the six trees per hectare, there's a 0% chance that a chicken will nest in that area. So that, that kind of shows how, how much chickens will avoid tree infested areas. So anything more than three trees in a hectare or an acre is, is too many. So we get fragmentation from human disturbances. And this could be as simple as just putting a house out in the middle of a prairie, which you know there are, and, and chickens can really kind of start adapting to that. But once you start getting things like wind farms and oil and gas development, like in the bottom right picture, or huge transmission lines going across the prairie, um, they tend to start avoiding this kind of stuff for nesting. Now, now they will still kind of lek in those areas because those leks are really traditional. Um, but once they realize that the hens aren't coming to those leks anymore, they're gonna slowly abandon those leks as well. All right, so our current situation um, here in Kansas, we, we again still have the stronghold of chickens in, in the United States. And we are the one of three states that still allows hunting. Um, and, and there's been plenty of science to show that, that really hunting that really has a neg negligible effect on, on prairie chicken populations. Um, there is no hunting on any lesser, lesser prairie chickens um, in, in any of the five states where they occur. So you can't hunt lesser chickens in Kansas. Um, we do have range-wide range -wide conservation plans. Um, so the lesser prairie chicken has a five state um, conservation plan to um, hopefully increase the amount of native grasses and, and uh, manage how those native grasses are being grazed, especially during drought years. Um, and then we have, we're working on, excuse me, get a drink. Um, we're working on a multi-state range-wide plan for the greater prairie chicken, but we do have a statewide um, one, and, and we work very closely with the federal government, the NRCS offices, to um, promote prairie chicken um, habitat on the ground. And so there's a lot of financial assistance available to private landowners. So if any of you out there listening right now are, are a private landowner and you're interested in prairie chicken habitat or wildlife friendly habitat, um, there's, there's plenty of financial assistance to get there, to get to that point where hopefully, you know, we can get chickens back on the landscape, or at least better numbers of chickens on the landscape. So, and I, I bring this back because, again, they, they are that umbrella species. They, there seems to be a lot of fuss about them, but there, there needs to be, because if we can manage for chickens and we can manage for all the habitat the chickens require, then we should be able to combat the decline of a lot of these other grasslands obligate species. And so with that, I kind of leave you with a little quote from the Save the Last Dance, um, kind of a biography of chickens that was put out, uh, I think it was by PBS a few years ago. So more than any creature, more than, ever, more than the bison even, the prairie chicken is the symbol of the Great Plains of North America. You can put bison on a fescue pasture and they'll thrive, but take the prairie grouse from its rolling native grasslands and it will wither and vanish. Prairie grouse must have prairie. So I guess that kind of ends it for me. Rachel, are you 
still there. Okay. <laughs> this is though. Hey, okay, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> um, yeah, what an incredible ending with that quote from Save the Last Dance. Um, thank you so much for uh, presenting this information. We've got some folks thanking you already in the comments. Awesome. Um, I will point out uh, a couple of things I'm going to, uh, how do I make you not pinned so that you don't have to be up there all by yourself? Um, you know what? It's fine. Oh, remove pin. There we go. <laughs> I know how to do Zoom. Um, okay, yeah. So, so first, um, I'm watching both YouTube and Facebook. So if anybody mm -hmm. has questions for Vicky, I've already seen a couple of them. I will get them to her. Just leave your comments in the comment box and uh yeah i'll be asking her those questions also this is kind of hilarious that illustration that you did of the prairie chicken surrounded by predators was an illustration <laughs> i did for a field crew working with prairie chickens in like 2012 and that made me really happy that was really that's awesome it was a good one. <laughs> oh gosh okay so um First, uh, I've got a question um, about the CRP cover and chicks, because you mentioned, and maybe I misheard you, um, at a certain point that some CRP grass wasn't good cover for chicks. Maybe you were talking about the other states besides Kansas, um, but you also mentioned that high insect abundance is key for the chicks, and we just last month had a whole program on CRP lands and mixes and how they benefit pollinators, so are there like are the CRP mixes that would promote insect diversity good for chicks? Like what are the recommendations on that CRP land for prairie chickens? So yeah, most of the, most of the CRP, especially the CRP contracts that are geared towards wildlife and are, and are high in diversity on pollinators um, are great and they're perfect. But the problem is, is that after about three to five years, if they have not been managed, if they haven't been burned or dissed or anything, to promote those forbs again, then they just become a solid rank stand of grass. And a lot of dead material is just sitting there, not, lo not allowing sunlight to the, to the ground to allow that new flush of forbs to come on. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem with the CRP program that we have is that it's, it's great for nesting, but um, you know, once those, once those birds hatch out, where are they gonna go? If it's just a solid stand of rank grass, the chicks have no ability to get around in. Right. And so what we suggest, um, and it, and, and a lot of contracts at least required at least once in a 10 or 15 year contract is to burn, um, or to disc, uh, or to, to hay it or something to set back that grass a little bit and allow that flush of forbs to come on again. And we actually suggest, you know, as biologists, when we talk to people about CRP, we suggest they do it more often. So once every five years, once every eight years is not enough, especially if the CRP is in the Eastern part of the state where we get enough rain, we suggest doing it once every three years. You know, why not just go out there and light a match and let it go? Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe don't let it go. Maybe you should slow, stop it at your boundary. Well, yeah, yeah, Con control, but let it yeah, go. Yeah, control. Um, awesome, thank you. Uh, okay, if, several more questions have just poured in, so I'll try to get uh, all of these for you. Krista Dollinger wants to know how the prairie chickens fared with the Anderson and Starbuck fires. So um, they're pretty mobile. They can, they can get out of the way if a fire is coming. Now, you know, immediately after the fire, um, you know, there, there was a potential that, that it, we probably saw a little bit of decline in that area, but you gotta think that area was highly infested with cedar trees. Mm. And that was a lot mm. of the reason that that fire got really bad really fast is because firefighters were not able to get into a lot of those areas because of the trees. So long-term, it probably benefited the chickens. Now there is a there is a research project going on down there right now for lesser chickens and other um, I think herps um, as well as some grassland birds. And so I think we'll see more long term research come out of that. But I think long term it's probably going to benefit the chicken. You know, it may it, short term you, we might have saw a little bit of decline for the first year or two. But definitely long term, I think it's going to be beneficial. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, that's a great tie in to Weston Fleming's question, which is uh, on a typical day, uh, how much movement would a chicken have during the day, like in, in the winter specifically, I think he's interested in? Yeah, the winter is going to be a lot more movement. Um, maybe not necessarily during the day, but 
um, feeding, going, going to and from feeding sites is probably their most movement. Um, in the Flint Hills, especially because there's not a lot of farm ground, uh, there's, there's people that know the chickens, they loaf in one area and they'll fly a mile or more to get to a feeding site that might be a, an oat or, or corn or beans or some sort of field um, for feeding. And so that they can make pretty good sized movements. And, and even historically, um, there's been records of them making small migrations and we're talking, you know, five, 10 miles. And so just to get yeah. to feeding sites, you know, when, when food was a real limiting factor. Wow. Awesome. Um, so yeah, speaking of effects on chickens, Aurora Mendia wants to know how the deep freeze we had recently and other similar cold events affect chickens. So you're going to have some, you're going to have some mortality for sure, as you did with most species. I mean, I know you know, we saw some, I, I saw on the Kansas birding Facebook page, a lot of people were seeing dead birds and I got calls about dead birds. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to have some mortality, but honestly, these chickens have been here for a long time and this isn't the first time they've had a freeze. Mm -hmm. So those mm -hmm. mortalities, hopefully this next year, we'll have a good boom year, you know, where we can have some good reproduction and make up for some of those losses. But yeah, definitely going to have some short-term losses, some mortalities to that. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn and Schwab would like to know uh, if, if there are plans for more aerial surveys in the future. There's one going on this year, actually. Okay. I think it was, we were supposed to have one last year, but you know, the whole COVID thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so that, yeah, we're having this one this year. So if you see um, some black helicopter flying over the Flint Hills, it's it's probably us not not dropping anything. We're not supposed to be we're just checking on chickens. Yeah. So okay. we, sh we should know more, hopefully, um, you know, sometime in the fall, we usually get a report back and so hopefully we'll have an idea of how our chickens have fared over the last four years. Yeah, awesome. Um, and maybe just to, to wrap us up here, I think it would be interesting to hear um, a little bit about like how you do prairie chicken surveys, because you mentioned and have shown lots of graphs of, of that data, but how, how do you um, get that data on prairie chickens? So we do spring booming ground surveys or LEC surveys. And so we have set routes that we do every year. Uh, I don't know how many there are across the state. I, there's, it's approximately one per county, um, but there are some counties that are left out. So it's not quite 105, it's probably you know 70 or 80 or so um, surveys. And um, we survey them. So we go, we go out to the starting point and, and we have 11 points along the survey and you stop at each one for three minutes and you listen for, for Lex, you listen for booming or gobbling chickens. Um, you hear the chickens, you mark it on your, on your, your app or your paper, or whatever you're using, go to the next point. Um, and then when you're done, you go back and you try to flush those Lex and see how many birds there are. And so we can get, it's basically just an indice. We can't actually get a population abundance, um, but we can get an idea of how many leks per mile that there are in that area. And then we extrapolate it for the whole state. Um, now the, the aerial surveys is where we actually get population estimates. Gotcha. Um, that's awesome. Oh, I just got a, a comment from someone who's interested in information about the financial assistance programs for farmland owners. Um, and there's a recommendation there for a group that we could share the information with. So I can uh, make sure that that gets shared with that group, Clara. Thank you. Um, Definitely. But uh, where can people look for that information if they're interested in uh, helping to restore uh, farmland to a more prairie chicken friendly environment? So a good place to start with, with is our biologists. And so you can go to ksoutdoors.com and under the wildlife tab, there should be a landowner assistance or something like that. Um, and then you can go to find your biologist. And so okay. it'll bring up a map and you can click on your county and it'll tell you who your biologist is. And then um, from there you can call the biologist. And, if, if, and we work really closely with the federal government, the USDA offices and so we know a lot of their programs, so we can get you in touch with any of them if we think that their programs are a better option for you or one of our programs. Or There's several programs out there, and it's it's almost overwhelming at times <laughs> how many programs there are. So we definitely encourage people to utilize them. 
Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Vicky. I don't see any other comments, but you guys are welcome to get in touch with Vicky. You can find her information uh, at, I guess you, you, your information is probably on uh, kinsoutdoors.com as well. It is. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. If you have any further questions for her uh, or you know how to find your biologist now, if you have questions about <laughs> your own land management for those landowners out there. Um, yeah. And I, I guess that's it for tonight. So again, thank you so much, Vicki. Um, it was a joy having you talk tonight and uh, thank thanks for sharing your expertise. Um, we yeah, all thank really you. enjoyed it quite a lot. I hope so. everybody gets out and finds a prairie chicken luck like this year. They're, yes. They're, they're a blast to watch. I love them. <laughs> yes. It sounds like there may be an opportunity if you go uh, on the field trip this upcoming, I almost said this weekend, Ooh. but that's not, what is time? Um, March 27th, the Marion County field trip that I mentioned. Awesome. So you may have an opportunity there. Of course, you can't guarantee anything with animals, um, but check out our website for more information. If you've never seen a prairie chicken, go try. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'll uh, sign off. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We'll see you next month to talk about some native gardening and native plants with uh, Brad Gurr from Dick Arboretum of the Plains. So <laughs> we'll see you guys later. <laughs>